I'm Jeff Murphy from Boston University Alumni Relations, and I'm your host for an interview series showcasing the career paths of our most interesting and accomplished alumni. Welcome to the Proud to Be You podcast. My guest today is Alan Ostfield, the president of Live Nation's North Atlantic Division. Alan's a double terrier, having earned his JD from the School of Law and an MBA from the Questrom School of Business. He and I spoke about the extensive experience he's had working in the field of sports law and negotiations and the lessons he's learned from important mentors in his life like Larry Lucchino. Alan, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to have you on the Proud to Be You podcast. My pleasure. Happy to join you. I'm curious. I, I usually just start with a little bit of background information with all of our guests. Did you grow up on the East Coast? Where where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, I was in Pittsburgh until college. Got it. And I, I, you've obviously gone on. We'll, we'll get into the details of your, your really interesting career in uh, sports management, entertainment, law. Um, were you an athlete or a musician as a kid? W when you were growing up, did you have any idea that you'd end up where you are now? I loved sports growing up. I I played every sport um, I could, and that's sort of all I did. Um, I was never into music, which is ironic considering what I do now. Um, but I loved sports and um, was a big part of my life growing up and, um, and, and still is from a recreational point of view. I know that you attended the University of Pennsylvania as an undergrad. Did you know at that time kind of what your career path was going to be, or were you still trying to figure things out during those college days? At that point, I knew I liked sports, but you didn't you didn't focus on it then academically. I think the way uh, students are now, a lot of students now are are focusing on sports and believing that there's a career in sports and and getting a sports management degree. Um, I, I was fortunate in the sense that the focus didn't exist back then. There weren't as many schools offering sports management degrees, and the reason why I say I was fortunate is because it it um, it didn't allow me to even think about that at that time. So it forced me just to get a good general education, which I think ultimately uh, served me well. And you majored in economics at Penn, is that correct? I did. It was a, a good general business background, majored in economics, and okay. didn't want to focus too much on business because sure. I knew I'd ultimately won an MBA. And so uh, you knew you ultimately wanted an MBA, and it wasn't long before you found yourself on the BU campus, right? Was it immediately after college that you, you came to BU? Yeah, I took a few months off because um, I graduated college a little early. So I took a little bit of time off. And um, at that point, I had applied to um, law school. Uh, and then I knew I was also going to apply to business school. The The combined JD MBA programs were really just getting started um, at that point. It was in the late 80s. Um, now, now, of course, uh, there's a lot of combined programs out there. But at that point, it was pretty early on. And when I saw the uh, combination of law school and business school, it seemed like a perfect fit for me. So was that the thing that drew you to BU or how did you make your decision to do your, your master's degrees here? Um, I was driven in large part at that point, the law school um, was very highly ranked and Boston is obviously a great city. And um, I was drawn in large part because of that. And then as I started thinking about the business aspect to it, uh, the business school um, was was uh, highly ranked as well and, and, and gotten even higher o over time. And the combination of that is what led me there over other schools I was thinking about. So now that we've placed you at BU and on your, your timeline, we've reached the portion of the podcast that I think of as the BU lightning round. Uh, some, so some quick stories about your time at BU. Where did you live when you were studying here? I lived in uh, Alston, Brighton area, just right out down down Commonwealth Avenue towards uh, it was a Chestnut Hill, um, right off of Com Ave for a couple years. Actually, right off of Com Ave all the years, just in different houses. And were there experiences, classes, or professors that you had during your time here that really stand out as maybe having had an impact on on your eventual career path? I think the professor who. Uh, who sticks out most to me, uh, Mark Pettit, Professor Mark Pettit in the law school. Uh, he taught uh, first-year contracts. Uh, he also taught evidence. Um, but I had him for first-year contracts, and um, he was a very – I mean, obviously, he was knowledgeable and educated, but he was also very uh, practical and analytical, and um, his, his classes had a way – of making just great sense to me. 
Uh, and to this day, I remember just the organizational thought that he placed into things, and um, that made an impact on me. Now, you're doing two degrees at the same time, both of which on their own are uh, quite a challenging task. Are you just in class and studying your face off the entire time that you're in Boston? Or were there, you know, student organizations you got to be a part of, other activities that you were doing that, you know, added to your learning? I studied a fair amount, but I was always pretty good at understanding how to get from point A to point B in the most efficient way possible. So um, I studied a lot. I got ahead of things a lot, um, but I don't think I studied too much. And actually, my my friends in law school used to used to kid me because I was always the one to say, "Who wants to go play baseball? Who wants to go play softball? Who wants to go play football?" Um, so, and I organized a lot of those sports intramural wise with a lot of the guys I uh, went to went to law school with. So I had a good a good time socially, athletically, and um, still was able to get my work done for school. Did you have a favorite? I mean, as a grad student, I, I realize your your experience might have been a little bit different. But do you have a favorite campus hangout or a secret study spot that you find yourself on on Com Ave all the time? For studying, I think I studied mostly at home. The law school library was good too, so that's probably where we went. A lot of my friends went to the undergrad library, but um, I didn't do that much. Um, in terms of hangouts, honestly, I can't even remember. Uh, it's now, now, now I'm dating myself. I can't even remember where I used to hang out, but I know we did. I don't remember where they were. Sure, sure, sure. Well, we'll have to get you back to campus at some point soon so we can uh, refresh your memory and we'll, we'll take you to some of those old hangouts. That'd be great. Um, so you, you wrap up your law degree first and then it's finishing the MBA. While you're wrapping up your final year here, what kind of decisions do you need to make? What what are you, what are the things that you're considering when you're sort of trying to figure out what that next step is going to be once you're ready to leave ComAF? At the point that I applied to the dual degree program, um, I didn't know if I wanted to be a lawyer or a banker or a consultant. I knew that it would it would um, create some options for me if I did well at BU. Um, once I got to law school, I actually, I was, I, th- I was one of the odd people that actually liked law school. Um, it was the, it was, I think the first time in my academic career that, that I enjoyed learning. Um, I enjoyed the way it forced your, your, the wheels in your brain to turn. I, I enjoyed that it wasn't regurgitating facts, that it was more, how are you thinking about this problem and how are you solving this? So I liked law school. Um, and, and as a result, perhaps I did well. And once you do well in law school at a school like BU, a lot of doors start opening up for you. So what, so what, so what ultimately ended up happening is because I like law school and because doors were opening up for me, I ended up looking at a lot of the, a lot of the big law firms. Um, so I was just at that point trying to think about what city do I want to be in, what kind of firm do I want to be in? What kind of practice do I want to be in? And then once you start going through that and you do your summer associate positions, it starts to, things start to narrow for you and become a little clearer. So what's that first uh, firm job uh, after BU? Where do you, where do you end up moving by the way? Well, um, I ended up making a mistake uh, and, and we can talk about that, but I ended yeah. up moving to DC, Washington, DC. And at that point um, I had, I was sort of caught up in the mode of this was in the late eighties, early nineties, New York, wall street finance. It was, if you're going to work for a big law firm and you're going to be in the corporate world, you need to be in New York. When I decided I was going to move to DC instead of New York, I got caught up in the, I need to be at a New York firm that just has a DC office. Um, and I ended up narrowing it down to two firms, uh, Wilmer Cutler and Pickering and Skadden Arps. And, um, I ended up choosing Skadden Arps, uh, uh, in large part. Um, I mean, I, I liked my time interviewing there, but because it was a New York based firm, um, and obviously it was one of the best firms in the world. So I was, I was honored to have been given an opportunity there as I was at Wilmer. Um, when I went to Skadden though, because of, I had to finish business school, uh, almost 20 months had elapsed between when I accepted my job offer in the fall of my third year before when I was actually going to start work. And the market had turned substantially. There was a big downturn in the corporate work. So they, so 
Skadden did the right thing and wanted to honor its commitment to its hires, uh, but they had to put us in different departments. So I was uh, I was placed in the energy project finance department, which ultimately would have made me an energy lawyer. Um, so after a few months, there I realized this was not this was not the place I wanted to be. So I had to make some changes. So you you mentioned making a mistake. What what was it about that that you feel that you made a mistake? Just that you had accepted a job but waited so long before starting? Well, I, I guess when you put it that way, it wasn't a mistake I made. It just turned out to have been a mistake is probably a better way to phrase it. Um, I ended up at Skadden and, and the market had changed and the department I was in uh, wasn't something I wanted to be. And if I stayed there and it was I, I was I was working with good people and I was working on good things, but I was going to be an energy lawyer. And that's not that's not where I wanted my career to go. So I needed to make a change uh, several months in, which is not an easy thing to do, especially when the economy wasn't wasn't um running as uh, highly as it was when I was coming out of law school. So those, you know, those forks in the road, those identifying an opportunity and a, and a need to make a change are things themes that come up again and again as we're doing this podcast. Um how do you make that change? Is that when you move to San Diego? No, that's when I'm no, I was I was only at uh, Skadden for about 6 months and um I mean I still needed to be I still needed to be a lawyer. I still needed to be trained as a lawyer. I still needed to get the big firm experience as a lawyer. So one day I um I I I literally called Wilmer. So 2 years after they offered me a job, I called the hiring partner. And I I reminded him who I was. I reminded him that they offered me a job 2 years ago. I told them the decision I made, um, I essentially had rejected them and went to went to um, one firm. Um, and I said, I'd like to change my mind. Um, I said, this isn't turning out the way I wanted it to be. I, I'd like to change my mind. And if they would um, see their way to having me, I'd be um, I'd be happy to make that change. And fortunately for me, they they were very busy in the department that I wanted to be in. And they hired me. So um, I look at it as a good second chance of going to Wilmer, which um, turned out to be, I think, you know, four or five of the best years of one's professional career. It's a phenomenal law firm, trains you to be phenomenal lawyers, phenomenal professional, um, and, and really one of those good forks in the road that just worked out very well for me. So at some point you, um, you know, I, I'm guessing that you still have this sort of sports management idea in, in, in the back of your head. You end up getting a great job with the San Diego Padres. Can you talk about how, how that transition went? Sure. So one of the things that happened is after I was at Wilmer for, I don't know, two or three years and I was a, um, I was a corporate lawyer doing some bankruptcy work. One of our clients at the firm was the Dallas Cowboys. One of the partners there, uh, had done some work for Jerry Jones when he bought the Dallas Cowboys in the late eighties and knowing my interest in sports, I, I walked into the partner's office and I introduced myself and, um, and said, I'd like to work with him on some projects. And he was, he was, um, kind enough to let me do that. So for a couple of years there, I was, I was able to do work for the Dallas Cowboys, which, which proved very valuable because it, it gave me the ability to say that I had sports law experience. A lot of people have an interest in sports, um, but I was able to actually say that I had some sports law experience, and um, and then ultimately, I um, I was able to come in contact with a guy who was also a former lawyer at a big firm in D.C., um, a, a, a competitive firm um, that had just taken over the San Diego Padres as president, and um, through a through a connection here and there, uh, actually from Wilmer. Um, they, uh, he connected me to the guy who, who just took over the San Diego Padres and he ultimately hired me as special assistant and then became general counsel. So now you've combined these aspects of your life, this, you know, interest in law and management with your, you know, interest in sports. Is it different at all from what you expected once you, once you enter that industry? Are, are you happy as soon as you're sort of working for the Padres? You end up being there for, for a few years, right? Yeah, I was there for four or five years and, um, very happy. It was a great experience, uh, personally, professionally. I worked for a guy named Larry Lacino, um, who a lot of Boston fans fairly well known to Boston fans. Yeah. So, you know, Larry is, um, one of the greatest, um, executives in sports. Um, he was also a former lawyer, so he knew what lawyers could do and, um, would not in any way pigeonhole a lawyer. 
So working for Larry was, I mean, to this day, in fact, I did it this morning with someone here who works for me. To this day, I refer to lessons I learned from Larry and how and how they, they've stayed with me now and how Larry's management of me helps me manage other people. Um, so working for Larry was phenomenal. He um, let me do everything, literally everything. I would, um, I would, I would, I would help negotiate player contracts with the general manager. I would do business things. I would do legal things. Larry and I negotiated, um, the, the, uh, contract with the mayor of San Diego for the, for the development and use of Petco Park. Uh, Larry had me do everything. Uh, so his, his willingness to expose me to everything and his, his being a perfect, um, role model in the sense that he was also a former lawyer who started out as general counsel, who ultimately became club, club president, um, uh, was a, was a perfect uh, person for me to work with. So, uh, you're, you're at the Padres for four or five years. And at that time you also, um, I think I saw on your LinkedIn profile, you, you've also been teaching along the way. How does that fit into your, your career path? Yeah, I, I did. I, um, so I was in San Diego, I was general counsel of the Padres and, you start to realize how unique your career is um, and how fortunate you are to have those opportunities. And of course, everything that I accomplished in in my career was a direct result of the education that I was fortunate enough to have. And then you start to put two and two together and realize, wouldn't it be good if I could share some of these experiences with other people? So um, I started thinking that it'd be great if I could teach and there's not a lot of general counsels of major league sports teams. Um, and I was able to get an, to be an adjunct professor at um, USD Law School um, teaching sports law. Obviously, I was general counsel of a baseball team, so it was a natural fit to teach sports law. Uh, a lot of work. Um, people have no idea how hard professors work to prepare for class, so everyone should be nice to their professors now. Um, uh, but it was wonderful for me to get that experience, and, it, and to this day, I've, um, I've continued that experience. I taught there. I taught in Michigan. Um, I taught at NYU and, um, actually right now I'm designing a course and I'm going to start teaching at Columbia in January. Oh, wow. That's great. So one of the things that strikes me about working in sports and sports management is that so much of, of your, uh, potential for success is kind of dependent on who's hired you, who's at the top of the organization, who owns the company is, I don't remember the timeline exactly, but is Larry Lucchino leaving the Padres, how you ended up leaving the Padres as well? Or am I off with my, my years? I left before Larry did. Um, I left in, uh, I guess the end of 1999 and I don't know exactly when Larry left, but I think it was a year or so after that. But yeah, so much of, so much of what we accomplish in life and what we're fortunate to be able to do is a direct result of, of those that we have the opportunity to work for. And like I said before, um, I mean, those four years with Larry are, 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 are worth 20 years. Yeah. So you then go to the, to, uh, the Pistons and Palace Sports. What, what made you decide to, to pack up and leave San Diego for, for Auburn Hills, Michigan? Um, you know, it certainly wasn't the weather. Um, it, you know, at, at that point I was, uh, I was probably in my low thirties. I was probably 34, 35. And, um, I do, I, I love San Diego. I love the Padres. Um, just as a sport, baseball was my favorite. Um, so there were a lot of reasons to stay. Um, ultimately, though, I needed to just continue to grow. And sometimes to grow, you have to move on. And um, I knew I wanted to do a few more things. And then when the opportunity with, with Palace Sports came up, um, it, 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 it struck me as a very great opportunity for me in the sense that um, at my law firm, I had worked for the Dallas Cowboys. Um, so I had experience in the NFL. Obviously, with the Padres, had experience in Major League Baseball. Then with the with the Palace Sports, we owned the Pistons in the NBA, the Tampa Bay Lightning in the NHL. I'd be able to have experiences sort of at the highest level working for sports in the big four professional sports leagues. Plus, at that point, the Palace had – they were running two arenas, two amphitheaters. It was a full-fledged sports and entertainment organization. So the breadth of that um, – uh, ultimately, within a year or two, I became chief operating officer. So the breadth of being there in a in a 
general business role, um, basketball team, hockey team, arenas, amphitheaters. It was sort of too broad of an opportunity to pass up. Mm-hmm. So you end up being with that organization for, I think it's just about 11 years and you, and you work through several titles. And I know you mentioned being a CEO, but you were also CEO president. What, what did you feel like you knew about sort of the skills, the, um, the personal characteristics that you needed to be successful and advance up the ladder in that organization? It's be, the ability to step into an organization at a high level integrate yourself, fit in, be welcomed, and yet still have influence and make a positive impact. Those are those are hard things to balance. A lot of people can come in and sort of, you know, just get along with people, but maybe they're not forceful enough to make a difference. Or you can come in and be a bull in a china shop. Um, and then maybe you can make an impact, but you're not going to be welcomed in or become part of the part of the team. I think that the the ability to do both of those, to blend both of those, is what allows you to fit into an existing organization that had very senior, successful people, um, and yet still make a difference. And and that's that's something that that the people at the palace um, allowed me to do, um, and I was able to do. And I think that ultimately led to my ability to make a positive impact there. So you have this, you know, uh, positive impact, but then there's an ownership change, right? Am I, rem- am I telling this story correctly that, uh, eventually sort of means you're out? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the way it works. So, uh, Mr. Davidson, who was a wonderful man and, um, uh, passed away in 2009 and, uh, he had it in his mind that the team would stay with the family forever. Um, Unfortunately, um, other people had different views and, uh, they ultimately decided to put the team up for sale, which, which prompted several years of, of, uh, transition related issues. Um, uh, and it was, it was, it was not easy, uh, to be sure. I mean, the organization was going through a lot of changes. It was a chaotic time. The economy was not good. The team was unfortunately not good at the time. It was a, it was a perfect storm of challenges hitting us. Um, in hindsight, it proved to be one of the better experiences of my career in the sense that I was called upon to um, help me and my colleagues help us all navigate through this. And um, while it might have been more pleasant not to have been called upon to do that, it was a phenomenal experience to have had the opportunity to do that. So you do that, you know, going in knowing that you're going to be sold and knowing that your position is such that it might cause you to move on. and um, that's just the way it is. And, uh, and you go in knowing that and not being a quitter and doing the best you can and, um, and, uh, hoping for the best. And, uh, of course, as David Cern always said, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And that's what I did. And, uh, it worked out just fine. So, I mean, obviously you talked about just sort of going into it with a positive attitude and doing the best that you can. Are there other lessons that you would share with somebody who, I mean, obviously not everybody's going through the same exact experience that you are, but somebody who's going through that kind of a transition that isn't necessarily of their own deciding, um, what, what do you tell people who are going through something similar? Well, I think, um, look, the first thing is, is don't, don't ignore that you're a human being and you have natural human being emotions and it's, and I think, I think, I think we're, I think people in the corporate world are, are, are taught to fight through things and, and, um, and ignore certain things. I really don't believe that, you know, there are, there are natural human emotions of concern with change and excitement about change and, and fear about certain things and tre- natural trepidation about certain things. And, um, and it's okay to recognize all of those things and, and deal with them. And that's really the way that I, talk to my colleagues that were there that that to put our head in the sand and pretend that the change was was not happening was just that's that's not a business plan that's that's just sticking your head in the sand so so we all knew what was on the horizon um we all knew that we should do our jobs well um and and the and the chips are going to fall where they may and and we could choose to behave one way or we could choose to behave in a productive way and and the people that stayed and fought through it, um, I think most of them chose to do that and, and um, embrace the change for the experience that it would provide for them. 
Were you tempted at any point to just jump ship? And it's it's admirable to hear that you sort of felt that this uh, sense of um, responsibility to the other employees and things like that. Are you are you putting out feelers? Or are you really just committed to doing the job that you're in and, and doing it to the best of your ability? No, I mean. Uh- a little bit of both. Yeah, I was I was tempted. I was tempted probably every hour of every day. Um, a, it was not a fun time. And B, I was virtually certain how it was going to end for me. So you put those two things together and, and you're naturally aware of that. Um, on, on the other hand, um, on the other hand, I had uh, there were I had a contract that allowed me the security of fighting through it. Um, and. and and I don't, I don't say that from an, from an administrative point of view. I say that because that, that created a dynamic where I didn't necessarily have to worry about my family, um, and being able to provide for them if and when the ultimate, um, resolution happened. Um, and because I knew the comfort that that provided for me, one of the things that I did when I first took over and I knew we were going through a sale is I got employment agreements for my top 22 people. Um, and I did that for the exact same reason because they didn't have employment contracts and I knew that, um, I knew what could ultimately happen to them. And I was asking them to make a sacrifice to make a commitment. And if I were going to do that, I was able to get the board to give employment agreements to these, to these 22 people that ultimately provided very, very, um, provided a lot of value, not just to the employees whose contracts ultimately had to be activated, but to the company. Because it because it allowed for this this successful transition, um, so we all were committed, but we all were sufficiently protected, which is really the fair thing all around. I, unfortunately, we're running up against our time a little bit, but I certainly want to talk about your current role. Um, you've got this really great position with Live Nation. After leaving Detroit, you've been at Live Nation for I think uh, about seven years now. Tell me a little bit about your your role uh, as president of the North Atlantic division and, and kind of over the years, the, the things that stand out that you're most proud of, the things about your job that make you happy. When I knew I was leaving the Pistons, I, I sat down and, and tried to figure out where I wanted to go. And I did this even before I left, but, uh, but I started to think about what would excite me for the next 10 years. And um, just like I was interested in going to the, to Palace Sports because it would, it would further extend my experiences. Um, I thought about companies like Live Nation that that I could further extend my experiences by being on the entertainment side or the music side. Having been on the sports side for 20 years, I could now extend it by going into the entertainment side. Um, I had had a relationship with people at Live Nation because they were our partner when I was at the Palace. So um, when they when they had this position available and wanted to talk to me about it. Um, it was a perfect way for me to extend my experiences into working for the world's leading live entertainment company, overseeing um, two of our top markets. So I, I'm involved in all of the concerts that we put on in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, um, about 900 shows a year, um, helping to do new business deals, working with politicians, working with venues, working, working with all the promoters here that work with me. Um, just helping the business run. You know, you mentioned when you started out that there there weren't a lot of schools that had a strong sports management program. When you look back over the years of your career, the different sports management positions you've had now, you know, concert and entertainment in New York City. Um, what 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 do you draw back on, and what what advice do you have to share with people who are interested into getting into sports and entertainment fields? there's two ways to do this. The, the first way is, is to, um, be focused very early on in your career and get one of your first jobs at an entry level position, whether it's entry level marketing or in sports selling tickets, which is a common way to get in, um, and work your way up. And that, and that's a, and that's a very common way. Um, and from a, from a numbers point of view, that's probably the most common way. That's not the way I did it. Um, the other way to do it, um, which is similar to the way I did it is, you know, become educated, um, develop your career as a professional, independent of the sports world, independent of the entertainment world. Um, and then you try to get in, um, at a, at a more, uh, substantial position. 
that's harder to do just by the sheer numbers of it, right? There's just, there's, there's far fewer opportunities. I think when you do, or if you do, I should say, you're going to be, it's going to be more rewarding for you. Um, uh, and if you don't, you still have a, a successful, hopefully, uh, profession to fall back on. So I think those are the two ways. I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way. It all depends upon the individual person and what's important to them and, and what flexibility they want to have. Well, Alan, thanks so much for taking time to talk with us. It was really interesting to hear about uh, how you how you got to where you are now and, and all the things you learned along the way. So, so thanks so much for sharing your story with BU. My pleasure. Happy to talk to you. Thanks again to Alan Osfield for joining me on the podcast. It was great to hear not just about how he built a career in line with his passions, but also how he learned to navigate changes and unexpected detours that he ran into along the way. Thanks, Alan. Thanks again for listening to the Proud to Be You podcast. If you like what we're doing, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review Proud to Be You wherever you download your episodes. I'm Jeff Murphy, and no matter where your path takes you, be proud to be you. The Proud to Be You podcast is produced by Boston University Alumni Relations. Our theme is from Jump and APM Music. To learn more about Proud to Be You, visit bu.edu slash alumni slash podcast.